new generation of young politicians pushing for independence from China. A new force has joined in on the election. A boom in internet media. His demand that the people of Hong Kong be allowed to decide their own future. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we're tracking this week. Hong Kong's election results amount to a blow for Beijing. How much did new media outlets have to do with the outcome? Questions over news content in Ukraine, a disputed election process in Gabon, TV channels in both countries come under attack. News unreported, Brazil's Amazon Basin, the stories that go untold. And 25 years after the launch of the World Wide Web, a minute-by-minute -minute report that's all about us. Hong Kong held elections this past week, and the initial reviews from the media on the Chinese mainland are none too favorable. That's because the results could be interpreted as the Hong Kong electorate trying to put the brakes on the advance of pro-Beijing interests there. Hong Kong's Legislative Council, or LegCo, as it's called, will now welcome some of the youngest legislators the former British colony has ever seen, many of whom came of age politically during the so-called Umbrella Revolution back in 2014. That movement was out to stem the growing political influence of Beijing and the government on the mainland. Out of that same movement, a new generation of fledgling media outlets was born. The politics of those outlets are varied, but they have provided platforms for novice politicians, the kind of candidates that mainstream media have tended to ignore. Despite often being shut out of official engagements, shunned by the political establishment, those upstart outlets have now proven their potential to have a real impact on the debate and leave legacy media increasingly compromised by Beijing's influence behind. Our starting point this week is Hong Kong. They call Hong Kong a semi-autonomous state. That same term, semi-autonomous, can be applied to most of the mainstream news media based there. Ostensibly, they operate independently of Beijing. But on a story like this one, with two political movements pulling Hong Kong in different directions, one towards Beijing, the other away from it, the coverage makes semi-autonomous seem like a stretch. Just like the Legislative Council itself, there are two sort of major camps in Hong Kong, more pro-democracy or pro-Beijing. The pro-Beijing media covers the government's news so often from the government's point of view that it seems to be the government's mouthpiece in many cases, such as helping Hong Kong's leader getting its own re-election, but for the pro-democracy media in Hong Kong. The story will be a new generation of Hong Kong people wary of Beijing's control in Hong Kong have got into power. Different media outlets carry different messages. For example, pro-establishment media all say things like how the pro-establishment camp is successful in maintaining the number of seats, or how the independence camp does not seem to have too many legislators. They say whatever is convenient for them. These legislative council elections were the first since politics in Hong Kong were shaken by the Umbrella Revolution two years ago. When Beijing announced electoral reforms, measures that activists in Hong Kong saw as restrictive, further eroding Hong Kong's semi-autonomy, those activists took to the streets. Borrowing a page from the global occupied movement, the demonstrators stayed on the street for four months. It was then and there that the foundation was laid for the way this election campaign would be fought online. Occupied uh, movement unleash a lot of energy. People want expression. And um, so digital is one way to do it. And that coupled with the disappointment, dissatisfaction with traditional media. So people said, hey, I'll create my own. The internet has really taken over as the major uh, forum. We look at the debates, we cut out uh, two minute, three minute cuts, and we post it. Now, people won't sit there and listen for two hours, but they will watch you for two minutes. And I think that is why the younger radicals, you know, are uh, 
you know, taken the you know, more or less center stage. The new generation of um, politicians, they are digital natives. It's second nature for them to use digital media. For instance, Eddie Chu, who won more than 80,000 votes, produced a good number of short videos including one who's widely circulated called Mr. Fox. To, to send a message. And they have a way of storytelling that's compelling and that people can relate to. Not that the new media upstarts have had this story to themselves. Over the past few years, Beijing's fingerprints have been left all over mainstream papers in Hong Kong, such as the South China Morning Post and Ming Pao. Both publications appointed new editors, and their subsequent shifts in editorial direction, both are now more in line with what newspapers on the mainland publish, has led to criticism and the loss of reporting staff. And there are also those with a pro-Beijing point of view, like Robert Chow of HKG Pao, taking their new media news platforms online. 60 years ago, the media is all owned by pro-Taiwan businessmen, mainly pro-British, pro-Taiwan. Nowadays, Hong Kong has changed over, so you will have more media owners who are pro their own government, pro-China. That's to be expected. You have press moguls who decide to run newspapers, TV, and then put their dirty hands into uh, politics, right? But with the internet, anybody can do it. In Hong Kong newspapers, once there are some new pro-Beijing figures appointed to be the editorial officials, there is a very interesting split between the editorial side and the reporting side. So the management and the lower level reporting side of media outlets are completely different worlds. However, only one of those worlds is reflected on the television side. There was a channel, ATV, that leaned toward the pro-democracy movement until it was bought out by a mystery owner from the mainland and shut down earlier this year. TVB remains on the air, but its critics like to call it CCTVB, after Beijing's state-owned broadcaster. The pro-Beijing side took a hit in these elections, despite holding the upper hand on the airwaves and in print. Powerful figures in the traditional media tend to think in an old-fashioned way. They think that as long as they can control the mainstream press, they can prove their value to Beijing. When they see that new media outlets have influence on the election results, they have to explain this to Beijing. We have less resources, but we are resourceful in our own way. When it comes to the world online, both camps are still able to compete against each other, just like that. It is rather difficult to be absolutely neutral in Hong Kong right now because the political split is really big. You can't really have a neutral point of view by having people uh, stating something neutral. What you can do is to include as many viewpoints as possible, be honest, and let the readers design uh, whether this is the whole truth in Hong Kong or are you missing something. One of the things missing in Hong Kong and in the coverage is what's known as the middle ground. A number of new players in the Hong Kong media scene are providing alternatives to the mainstream news media there. Here are some of the outlets making an impact. For just over a year, the Hong Kong Free Press has sought to, quote, bridge the gap between Chinese and English reporting in and about Hong Kong. A counter to the restrictions and self-censorship which are increasingly stifling the local media, HKFP also keeps a close eye on press freedom issues. Among the media outlets pushing for an empowered local political scene, Post 852 was formed by former print journalists frustrated by editorial compromises their papers were making as a result of Beijing's influence. Volunteer-funded outlets like Post 852 are picking up the page views that are being dropped by the mainstream news media. On the pro-Beijing side, Speak Out Hong Kong was launched by supporters of Hong Kong's chief executive, CY Leung. It has a sizable following on Facebook and has used that platform to mobilize pro-Beijing protests. Finally, there's TV Most. 
The online channel began with parodies of a pro-Beijing broadcaster. Now it's branching out into mini-documentaries and interviewing influential figures on sensitive issues. Other media stories that are on our radar this week, the people of Gabon on the west coast of Africa are living in a news and information vacuum in the aftermath of a disputed election held two weeks ago. The official results had the incumbent president, Ali Bongo, winning a tight race. However, opposition candidate Jean Ping is claiming a sizable victory and accusing the Bongo family, which has ruled Gabon for 50 years, of election fraud. <laughs> Amidst the violent street protests in the capital, Libreville, two private opposition TV channels, RTN and Tele Plus, were attacked, their studios vandalized. RTN's chief executive, George Bruno Ngusi, alleged that government forces were behind that attack. A pro-government paper, L'Union, disappeared from the newsstands after reporting that it had been attacked by arsonists. Some state-owned channels, like Gabon 24, have stayed on the air with reduced output. Given the lack of domestic sources, many Gabonese are now relying on French news outlets, Radio France International, France 24, and TV5 Monde to get their news. The Maldives are known to most as an idyllic, tranquil Indian Ocean island destination. But police there have raided the offices of one of the country's leading news websites after the broadcast of an Al Jazeera documentary accusing the president of corruption. The Al Jazeera doc went to air September 7th. It looked into theft, bribery and money laundering at the highest levels of the government. That same day, police raided the offices of the Maldives Independent, backed by a court-issued warrant which referred to an alleged conspiracy to topple the government. The site's editor, Zahina Rashid, had been interviewed for the Al Jazeera story. She says she was forced to leave the islands ahead of the broadcast because she was repeatedly threatened with prosecution under a tough new defamation law. That law was passed last month. It stipulates jail terms and steep fines for media outlets, journalists and social media users who break it. According to the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists, this new law threatens to further stifle the beleaguered press and marks a significant step backward for media freedom in the Maldives. A television channel in the Ukrainian capital of Kiev was under siege this past week, blockaded by protesters, some of whom tried to burn it down. InterTV came under attack, accused of serving pro-Russian interests. Staff fled when the building was set ablaze. Five people were injured. The blockade has now ended and the channel is continuing to broadcast. But demonstrators say they'll be back if Inter does not change its editorial tone. The Ukrainian government has long accused Moscow of waging a propaganda war on the airwaves as part of Russia's support for separatist rebels in the east. InterTV is co-owned by a fugitive tycoon, Dmitro Firtash, who has extensive business interests in Russia along with two former Ukrainian government officials who worked under the deposed president, Viktor Yanukovych. For the people running Fox News in the U.S., 2016 has amounted to one long public relations nightmare. The latest twist has the channel accused of hiring a private investigator to obtain the phone records of a reporter. Joe Strupp works for Media Matters, a left-leaning media watchdog that officially monitors all U.S. media but spends the bulk of its time debunking what's reported on Fox. New York Magazine reported this past week, quoting anonymous sources within the network, that former Fox CEO Roger Ailes ordered that Strupp's phone records be obtained so that his sources inside Fox could be identified. Ailes left Fox two months ago after a series of sexual harassment allegations against him. The lawsuit that started it all, filed by former anchor Gretchen Carlson, was settled this past week for a reported 20 million dollars. In a statement on the case involving its reporter, Media Matters referred to a pattern of intrusion involving Fox's parent company, News Corporation. From what we witnessed with Rupert Murdoch and News Corp's prior phone hacking scandal, it's critical for an immediate investigation of Roger Ailes and any other employees who may have been involved in this illegal practice. After leaving Fox, Ailes joined the Trump campaign as an advisor, but has managed to find the time to put New York Magazine and one of its reporters, Gabriel Sherman, on notice, threatening to file a defamation case against the publication. We're going to take a look now at a part of the world that doesn't get the news coverage it deserves. The Brazilian Amazon is immense. It spreads across nine states, is part of the largest rainforest on the planet, 
and is home to 25 million people. The stories are there, and they go beyond the environmental. There's the drug trafficking, the land grabs, the indigenous issues. However, Brazil's national media prefer to focus on political power grabs in Brasilia, business reporting from Sao Paulo, and the entertainment industry in Rio. Media outlets based in Amazonia have a big problem with independence. Many are owned by local politicians or business figures who are invariably white and who are more concerned with their bottom lines than stories affecting the indigenous non-white population. The Listening Post's Paulo Ganino now from Manaus on the challenges of covering the Brazilian Amazon. Roughly half the size of Europe, the Amazon accounts for 60% of Brazil's national territory, a little more than 10% of its population, 25 million people. However, the region is hard to reach, and when they talk about a lack of infrastructure, they mean it. The Amazon rivers are our main roads. We don't have much access to a road network. You need to travel by plane or you need to take a boat to travel along the river. So access may be the biggest challenge. The media, especially online outlets, are insisting more and more on immediacy. And the cost of travel make it difficult to cover a lot of stories. It's not many channels that can pay the money needed to get around the Amazon region quickly. If it's in the interest of media owners that we cover news on some new political proposal from a certain party, then there's funding for the reporting. But if it's not, they tell you right away that there's no money. Beyond the physical and geographical challenges, you might actually be risking your safety in some areas. There are places where you feel very unsafe to work in, because the media there belong to political barons. They are the most influential people in the area. And I can tell you, they do not like to be bothered or questioned. Amazonia's economic glory days were in the late 1800s. The global demand for rubber connected the Amazon to Brazil and the rest of the world. The resulting wealth created a new elite, and Manaus, the capital city of Amazonas, came to be described as one of the gaudiest cities in the world, twice as rich as major Brazilian coastal towns like Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. Manaus and the Amazon are in danger of isolation. All the major national media have shut their bureaus here, leaving news coverage, crucial not only to Brazil but to the global environment, in the hands of a few poorly funded startups and local outlets linked to businessmen and politicians. The closure of local bureaus is a problem because it centralizes journalism in the south and southeast of Brazil. The north and northeast are forgotten regions. They are almost neutralized by journalism. So although there's questions around the forging of property ownership documents, wood extraction, global warming, agribusiness, that's just not interesting for the media companies. Mainstream national media coverage is very much based on stereotypes and doesn't manage to move beyond that to see what the Amazon really is. But I think there are issues that even the outlets already covering the Amazon need to look at in greater depth. For instance, issues relating to the indigenous people here. The Belo Monte Dam on the Xingu River is a huge project and should be a big news story, since it symbolizes the conflict between economic development and conservation in Brazil. When the dam is finished in three years, it will be the fourth largest in the world, delivering hydroelectricity to Brazil's main grid, in order to power energy-hungry cities in the developed south. It will also flood 400 square kilometers of rainforest and chase up to 40,000 indigenous peoples from the place they call home. Subjects like the environment are often left out by the local press, and in the national media the narrative is very positive towards these projects. So the social and environmental impact of all of this is pushed to the background, never taking center stage. The information about the actual people who will be affected 
plays a minor part in the news. Vai, vai ficar muito bonito, é, podendo inclusive é, incrementar a economia do turismo na região. Né? O leitor da Amazônia ele ainda não enxerga. The urban reader still doesn't really consider indigenous people to be part of its world. It's as if they are out there in the forest and I am here in the city, so it doesn't interest me. I think it shouldn't be like this, but this is the reality we are faced with. There's still a lot of prejudice against Brazilian minorities in the media. Índios isolados na floresta amazônica estão a serviço do tráfico de drogas numa terra em que o crime faz a lei. Na... That happens with indigenous people, but also with black people and with the poorest. The fact is, the media represent a social stratum of economic power, and so it's not surprising that the issues affecting indigenous peoples are left in the background. And this is not a notion of today. It's historical since the days of military dictatorship. I thought this would end, but it didn't. We're tired of this. And now we're trying to reverse this. But I can tell you the media coverage of indigenous affairs is still very insufficient. There are more than 1,700 television stations in the Amazon, but most of them, including affiliates of national networks like Globo, are owned by or aligned with the white business elite, local politicians, or religious organizations. They cater to Amazonian cities, where most of the white population lives. They say history is written by the victors. The same can be said of journalism. The Europeans who conquered these lands centuries ago largely remain in control of Brazil's media and power institutions. And on the airwaves, in the Amazon, their interests seem to come first. Brazilians identify with what's being shown on TV, but local broadcasters need an overhaul, not only in terms of their content, but also with regards to their association with the Amazonian reality. We have channels that are either owned or connected to power centers. These broadcasters end up using the media for their own personal interests. You'll find small cities in the Amazon packed with so many TV channels. It will be dictated by the political forces at play there. In the state of Maranhão, for instance, the Sarnay family owns the main newspaper, Estado de Maranhão. It also owns the main TV network, Grupo Miranche, and it owns radio stations. They have held power for 50 years. A media landscape divided up amongst local oligarchs. A lack of funding that is squeezing the scope of reporting in the region and a history of both social and editorial marginalization of indigenous peoples. This is the picture of journalism in the Brazilian Amazon today. It may be part of the biggest region in Brazil, but you wouldn't know it if you were watching the news. Finally, it was 25 years ago last month that the World Wide Web got up and running. It went public in August of 1991, although only a few tech-savvy individuals who would come to be known as geeks knew how to use it back then. Times have changed. Earlier this year, a tech company called Excelicom compiled data on what happens during an average Internet minute. Their geeks added up the collective number of emails or tweets or times that we log on to Facebook or Instagram. In short, all of the things we now do instead of watching television or reading newspapers. The numbers are staggering and a little disturbing. We leave you now with an average Internet minute in the year 2016, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Thank you.